Hello everyone, welcome back. This is part two. If you've just watched part one, then you're ready for this. If you haven't, then you should probably watch that to know what's going on. Video. Because Shahrazad told so many tales, it was easy for anyone to add or subtract stories to the collection. Aladdin, Sinbad the Sailor, and Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves are all tales from this book that were added at a later point. Some of the major protagonists of 1001 Nights are Harun al-Rashid and his vizier, Jafar. Yeah, this is the Jafar that inspired the Disney villain. The real Jafar actually came from a powerful family called the Barmakids, who were originally Buddhist from Afghanistan. Jafar convinced Harun to open the first paper-making houses in Baghdad. As the Arabs had just learned how to make paper from the Chinese, and paper was much more efficient as it was cheaper and easier to make than parchment made from animal skin, and don't even get me started on papyrus. Paper, combined with Baghdad's many different people, cultures and languages, created an intellectual revolution. Arabic was the language of the empire, but scholars in Baghdad became experts in translation. In Baghdad, you could find people reading the words of Aristotle or the Buddha, all the way to the Hindu Vedas and Zoroaster. Jews, Manichaeans, Christians, Zoroastrians, Buddhists and Hindus met and exchanged ideas. One result of this exchange was Arabic numerals, the ones that we use today, including the revolutionary number zero. These originated in India, were improved on by scholars in Baghdad and then spread from the Middle East to Europe. Baghdad was a crossroads of knowledge filled with schools and libraries, the most important of which was the House of Wisdom. We don't know much about it, but it looks like this was a combined library, academy and research institute that welcomed scholars from around the world to translate, preserve and debate their works. Under Harun's son, the Caliph al-Mamun, the House of Wisdom became the world's largest library and the most important storage site of knowledge since the Library of Alexandria, with books in Arabic, Greek, Latin, Persian, Syriac, Chinese and Sanskrit. Many ancient Greek texts only survived due to Arabic translations of them, which made their way into Europe during the Renaissance. Greek philosophy influenced the Middle East so heavily that the Arabic word for philosophy is just falsafa, which is just philosophy said differently. Here you can see an Arabic painting of Socrates, or in Arabic, Socrat, teaching his students. Caliph al-Mamun paid scholars to travel abroad and bring back books. Once those books got to Baghdad, they were copied, translated and sent to other scholars across the empire. After wars, Mamun would actually demand books when negotiating peace treaties. He became so obsessed with collecting genius, he apparently offered the Byzantine emperor 2,000 pounds of gold for a mathematician called Leo living in Constantinople. They refused the offer. If Leo had moved to Baghdad though, he would have had quite the life. One scholar, the Nestorian Christian Hunyan ibn Ashak, lived in a mansion and received a massage and manicure daily. One scholar said about Baghdad, Nowhere in the world have I seen better financial arrangements to assist a scholar. This thirst for knowledge sparked the Islamic Golden Age. Just a quick note about this name, it's called the Islamic Golden Age, but many Zoroastrians, Christians and Jews contributed. The Golden Age included people from Central Asia to Iberia. It was so successful because the Caliphs built a multicultural empire obsessed with learning. Some scholars have actually suggested using the name Arabic Golden Age because the main language was Arabic, but it's still being debated. The House of Wisdom brought together different scientific traditions from around the world, and they saw the differences between Iranian, Indian and Greek texts, which meant they couldn't all be right. So these scholars didn't just copy and translate books, they tested them, they commented on them and they developed new ideas around them. Like algebra, invented by Al-Khwarizmi. He combined Indian and Greek mathematical ideas and made something new, mathematics without numbers. Like when you calculate with X and Y. This completely revolutionized science and made me fail maths class. It's only thanks to Khwarizmi that we can use algorithms for example. The word algorithm is just a mangled Latinized version of Al Khwarizmi's name, from Al Khwarizmi to Algorithmus to Algorithm. Baghdad led the wow. world in cartography and astronomy. Didn't realize that, that's very interesting and awesome. 
Scholars in Baghdad upgraded the astrolabe, a device that measures the incline of an object and can help navigate over sea and land. An experiment funded by Caliph Mamun, which included an astronomer called Al Fergani, calculated the circumference of the Earth to be about 38,000 kilometers, which is about 4% off the real number. Some Italian guy called Christopher Columbus wow. actually used Al Fergani's calculations for a voyage that he was planning, but he converted the Arabic miles incorrectly and thought the Earth was about half the size it actually was. He got very lucky that he crashed into a continent. Caliph Mamun funded the construction of the world's first scientific observatory in Baghdad and scholars there became experts in the stars. That's why there are so many stars with Arabic names. The Big Dipper's seven stars all have Arabic names. Over time, some star names have been Latinized, but most of these stars got their names more than a thousand years ago. Alchemy, alkali, alcohol, algebra, algorithm are all Arabic names. They also developed distillation, a way of separating liquids through differences in their boiling points. This meant that they could make some really strong alcohol, which wasn't banned in Islam yet, but actually the main application of distillation was to produce scents. Distilled rose water, for example, was used as perfume, especially beard perfume, but was also added to cosmetics, foods, and drinks. They also popularized hard soap and had massive soap factories. As a person has to get on packed trains regularly, I am extremely grateful for this. Hmm, is that rose water? They perfected the distillation of crude oil into kerosene for lamps, a process without which we wouldn't have gasoline, asphalt, or plastic. We have reports from the early 13th century of Muslims paving their streets with asphalt, something that wouldn't be seen anywhere else till Paris paved their streets with asphalt in 1838. In 805 CE, the first wow. general hospital opened in Baghdad. Soon there were 30 more throughout the empire. Some developments included separating wards by disease, having in-hospital pharmacies, and keeping patient medical records. They even had psychiatric wards. This was revolutionary in a time when the mentally ill were taught to be possessed by demons in many parts of the world. These were the... This is, uh... This is kind of blowing my mind now. Like, I would say something and throw in things, but I don't know what to say. I, I didn't know any of that. This is awesome. First, modern hospitals where doctors follow the code of obligation towards their patients, regardless of their wealth, religion, or background. All doctors had to pass examinations in order to practice. These were the first medical diplomas. They also invented peer-reviewed studies, clinical trials, and testing medicine on animals before humans. These doctors invented hundreds of surgical instruments and new techniques. For example, cataracts is a condition that clouds the lenses of the eye, and it ruined many lives in the ancient world. Sure. But we have descriptions from the 10th century Islamic world of a procedure that involves sucking the cataracts out of the eye through a syringe a procedure similar to what modern medicine used up until laser surgery took over in the late 20th century. Oh my god. They also had these devices that boring historians called automata. But I'm no historian. Their rules don't bind me. These are robots. Super cool medieval robots. Some of these automated machines are described in an amazingly titled book called The Book of Knowledge of Ingenious Mechanical Devices. Some devices described are an automatic water and soap dispenser, a giant elephant clock, a boat with a full robot band, and a programmable flute that plays itself, which seems to be humanity's first programmable machine. They also describe a very elaborate way of playing spin the bottle. This multi-storied robot was a whole party in itself. It was placed in the middle of a room. The first floor had a girl pouring wine, the second floor provided the music with four women playing instruments. The third floor was the entertainment, a male dancer, and at the top was a horseman carrying a lance. He would spin round and round and every 20 minutes the horseman would stop. The lucky person that ended up in front of the lance would drink the whole litre of wine that the first robot girl was pouring. This just sounds like a really fun party to me. <laughs> this golden age thrived for a couple of centuries, but in 1258 CE, the Mongol leader Hulago 
grandson of Genghis Khan, conquered the city. They burned it down, destroyed the House of Wisdom, massacred the population, and... One thing that I've heard before was for Alexandria, um, there were all the books, like, the, I don't want to say the book of books of knowledge, but there were, like, books and... The, it got burned down, and they said it set civilization back. I want to say they said it set it back like a couple thousand years or something like that. I have to believe the same thing's true then for this. You know, what we know about it now is probably just so minuscule compared to what we could have known. I, I mean, you know, what what he's saying right now is amazing but how much do we did we forget how much did somebody say oh I think I remember something da, 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 da. and then they kind of remembered it and they did their best and then they they tried to put it back out and then they get credit for it not you know I'm just saying I'm sure there are some things out today that the credit f f doesn't go to them as it should or uh, things are just lost to history and you know we'll never know about it but i have to say that it sounds like if things weren't recovered or um redesigned to be able to put back out so people could could get it i gotta say this was a, another loss i didn't know much about baghdad but i'm i'm extremely impressed killed the caliph. Legends say that the Tigris River ran red with the blood of the city's citizens, and then afterwards it ran black with the ink of its libraries. The fall of Baghdad to the Mongols ended the Abbasid Caliphate, but Baghdad as a city still attracted scholars well into the 15 and 1600s. It never completely vanished, and so the city standing today has been occupied since at least the times of Hammurabi. Today, little of what the Abbasids built remains. One of the few survivors is the Great Mosque of Samarra, which gives us a glimpse of what they were capable of. Baghdad and most of Iraq would go on to be conquered by the Ottomans and then colonized by the British Empire. The city was chosen to be the capital of the Republic of Iraq in 1958. Terrorism and a decade-long occupation by the United States military have destroyed much of the city. But today, in a recovering Baghdad, you can still walk down Mutanabi Street, a thousand-year-old street dedicated to booksellers and readers, and take part in Baghdad's ancient obsession with sharing knowledge. That's so cool. Sharing knowledge is so important that Kogido and a bunch of our creator friends got together and made n Wow. That's so cool. I didn't know any of this. Did not know any of this. Wow, early the medieval Baghdad was it was an amazing place. Wow. I'm gonna end this here. I'm gonna uh, pass this video along to a couple people I know. Not my version of it, because you know I don't want to ruin it. So I'm gonna pass this version along to a couple of people I know and have them watch it. I think they'll find it very interesting. Well, I look. I, I I appreciate the the request for this. This is this is it's it's a few times that I've been kind of pleasantly surprised with what I've seen. Other times, you know, you, you're not quite sure, but this was one of them for sure. This was this was. You know what? If I can. I want to f real fast find the name of the person. Uh, wow, it's one word, so it's going to be kind of difficult. Supremer, Supremer, Com Commander. Yeah, you're not going to be able to read it, but that's that's you and your. Uh, garbled thing and that was my reaction I responded to you by the way when uh, I, I was on vacation so 
anyways, I'm going to end this here. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was a damn good video. This is a damn good video. I don't, I don't have anything to say. I'm just sitting here. Just, I'm marveling at, at what I just watched. This is great. This is great. I'm going to end this here. And uh, thank you very much. This, thank you. Sincerely, thank you.